crumpet. Espresso. Crumpet. Espresso. Welcome to another edition of your favorite World Soccer Weekend Preview, Crumpets and Espresso, presented by the Soccer Down Here Network. I'm Jason Longshore, and we've got to start with the wild news out of London. Mauricio Pochettino out, Jose Mourinho in. All of the chaos that comes with Mourinho's appointment has already started. We've seen rumors linking Zlatan Ibrahimovic to Spurs. We've seen press conferences where Mourinho says he's humble and then in the next answer, I think, talks about how he can't relate to a team that lost in the Champions League final because he hasn't done that. So, welcome to uh, Crazy Town, Tottenham. It's it's only going to pick up from here. Let's see what else is going on in England from John Nelson. Crumpet. All right, time to take a peek at what's going on in the Premier League and maybe some championship here, too. And let's start things off with West Ham and Tottenham. And right now, Tottenham, for those of you that believe in this kind of thing, our Thanksgiving purveyors, our Thanksgiving table purveyors, are looking at Tottenham at minus 134 to win outright in the Jose Mourinho debut. Uh, really, for me, what I'm looking for in this one is how does the team respond? Does he get the new manager bump and how much of it? is there, considering that these two teams are hanging out right there at the bottom of that mess from 5th down to 16th or so, or 17th, really, when it comes to the standings. I think Tottenham probably wins. Won't be the prettiest thing in the world. Might be one nothing, might be 2-1, but I think that Tottenham, at least early on, gets three points. Arsenal and Southampton. Arsenal to win is at minus 223. Really, you look at uh, Mauricio Pochettino, but then at the same time, you're wondering, okay, what's the career dissipation light looking like for Unai Emery? The uh, juice box folks, courtesy of our friends at Bet365, are looking at Arsenal at minus 223 to start off. And uh, Southampton, this really could go on a two-way. Southampton scores first in a shock. Arsenal comes back, wins 2-1, or Arsenal takes care of business 2-0. I could see it going either way. Bournemouth and Wolves, really, this one looks to me like a draw, one one point each. Leicester is at plus 100, and uh, they are right now the story of the Premier League as we're coming out of the international break. Leicester, right now, if they keep things moving, they could finish third. We just don't know what Team Brighton uh, is going to put out there, so I've got to go with Leicester full points, probably 2 nothing or 3-1 because of the offense that Brighton sometimes does not show. Liverpool and Crystal Palace, uh, no Salah, no Robertson, no big deal, at least for me. Liverpool at minus 250, Crystal Palace plus 650. Look for Liverpool 3-1-ish if Crystal Palace gets on the board. Everton is a minus 275 going up against Norwich. Norwich is in the relegation fight right now. I think it will be all season long. Really, the offense that was there at the beginning for Daniel Farca isn't. So look for Everton, full points, probably 3-1. Watford and Burnley. Watford's going to be in the relegation discussion. This one, uh, plus 130, plus 210 if you're a Burnley fan, according to Bet365. I think Burnley takes this one, if not come out of it with a point. So I'm looking at Burnley 2-1, if not uh, 1-1. And then uh, Man City and Chelsea. Uh, Manchester City right now, minus 225. Sounds about right. I think Manchester City gets it done. 2-0, maybe 3-1 if Chelsea gets on the board with Mason Mount or with Christian Pulisic. Then your early action on Sunday, you're looking at uh, your only game Sunday, Sheffield United, Manchester United. I love what Chris Wilder is doing. And if uh, Brendan Rodgers was not my main candidate for a manager of the year, it would be Chris Wilder. Sheffield plus 250, Manchester United plus 120. I'm looking draw here. I think that uh, Sheffield United can get a point. So I'm looking at uh, 1-1, Sheffield United, and then Monday Night Football, Aston Villa and Newcastle. Newcastle's won two in a row. I don't think it's going to be three. Uh, Really, this one screams either goalless draw or 1-1 draw because John Joe Shelby can only do so many good things for a consecutive period of time. Looking at the uh, championship uh, you have some favorites that are pretty slight. Leeds is a pretty big favorite against Luton Town at minus 200. And you have uh, Fulham and QPR starting things off on Friday night. 
Charlton and Cardiff, Blackburn and Barnsley, Blackburn favored, Brentford favored against Reading. Sorry, Jess, hope your voice gets better. Uh, draw for Bristol City, Nottingham Forest, Nottingham Forest, Derby and Preston, North End looks like a draw, Huddersfield, Birmingham City, I'm going to go with Birmingham there, leads once again the prohibitive favorite against Luton, Swansea, slight favorite against Millwall, uh, insert drop here if you wish, and then West Brom, a slight favorite against Sheffield United. Sunday, the only match in the championship, Middlesbrough and Hull. That one's looking like a draw because then they have to turn around and do the Thanksgiving fixtures, at least during our week. There's some on Tuesday and some on Wednesday as well. So you want to see how teams manage themselves Friday and Saturday and Sunday having to come back for Tuesday and Wednesday. Jason, that's your look at uh, soccer in the Prem and in the championship. I'm going to check something out real quick. Uh, of course, going into League One, AFC Wimbledon, plus 187, going up against Gillingham. So that's looking like a draw or a Gillingham lean. That's it for me. Back to you. Espresso. Let's get into the rest of Europe and what's on the cards this weekend. We'll start with the espresso from Italy, where our good friend, the garlic bread warlord, Nick Alifi, is, I believe, maybe actually on the ground in his native Italia, uh, as this is posted. If not, he will be shortly. So... What will Nick be looking at? His beloved Milan in 14th place are hosting 7th place Napoli. This is the game of the weekend in Serie A, and mainly because both teams are kind of a mess or a complete mess, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, Milan, after changing managers, has only won one match against Spall. Napoli, the players are still furious with owner Aurelio De Laurentiis. You, you could have Carlo Ancelotti leave because of how bad it is. You have the owner's son out singling out individual players to hold up as, as role models and trying to slam the rest of the squad. And uh, the, the game's going to be fascinating because of all the subplots. Neither team is playing at the level that you would expect them to be playing either historically or currently. I mean, Napoli was a title contender last year, and they're not looking like it now. Milan would like to get back to the glory days. Right now, it's the glory days for Juventus. They are one point clear at the top of the table. It's a big match for them on Saturday morning, 9 a.m. It's on ESPN News. No Cristiano Ronaldo. He did not make the trip as Juve heads to fifth place Atalanta. Atalanta has been a surprise over the last couple of years. They are the highest scoring team with 30 goals in Serie A, and they will be trying to pull the upset against a Ronaldo-less Juve. The team that's hoping that happens, and they hope to take advantage of it, is Inter. They are on the road at 11th place Torino. Let's move over to Spain, where, no surprise, Barcelona, Real Madrid, top of the table, both on 25 points. The surprise is that 1st through 10th are separated by 5 points. Atletico, Madrid, and Sevilla are level on 24, Real Sociedad on 23. So top 5 separated by 2 points. Barcelona heads out on the road to face Leganes. They lost 2-1 there last year. This year, however, the hosts last place only one win on the season. Atleti, they are happy to get Joao Felix back from injury. They'll be traveling to 8th place Granada. Real Madrid in maybe the most intriguing matchup of the weekend. They host 5th place Real Sociedad. And the storyline is Martin Odegaard, on loan from Madrid, is at Real Sociedad, and he will be playing in this match. He has said he will not celebrate if he scores a goal. He's been the, the player that everyone has been waiting for to break through at Real Madrid. He hasn't yet, but he's having a, a, a good season at La Real. 
Real Sociedad. We will see how this goes. Only two points separate those two teams. On Sunday, fourth place Sevilla travels to Valladolid in Spain. La Liga, it's the same two at the top that you expect with Atletico Madrid right there one point back. But the fact that it is so crowded makes every game really, really interesting. And when you look at a Barcelona team that is at the top, but the rumors are still swirling about Ernesto Valverde, about potentially Marcelo Gallardo from River Plate, about changes, about what could happen. And now you have the added specter, I think, for any major team in the world that Mauricio Pochettino is out of a job and will be, if not the first call, one of the first calls if things get a little rocky. Maybe the pressure on all of these different clubs and managers has been ratcheted up a bench a bit. Now, remember, Pochettino played and managed at Espanyol, Barcelona's crosstown rivals. I think most people think of Barcelona's rival as Real Madrid, which is understandable. But Espanyol, Barcelona, Pochettino has said he would not go to Barcelona. He hasn't been offered anything, but he has said he would not go to Barcelona. Real Madrid might be a different story. I don't know. This is all going to be really, really interesting as it continues to get fleshed out. But La Liga, a very, very compelling title race thus far. Keep an eye on all of these matches this weekend. Brötchen. And now we head to the Bundesliga, where the big story was today. Last place, Paderborn took a 3-0 lead on Borussia Dortmund. Dortmund did fight back at home. They did get a 3-3 draw. Marco Royce with an equalizer in stoppage time. But, oh, man, only two wins in their last six for Lucien Favre's team. Borussia Mönchengladbach remains at the top of the table, four points clear. RB Leipzig, Bayern Munich, Freiburg, all on 21 points behind them. The leaders travel to face 11th place Union Berlin on Saturday. Bayern is on the road at Fortuna Dusseldorf, who you might know as the club of U.S. men's national team goalkeeper Zach Steffen. He is expected to be back in the starting lineup for Dusseldorf. Hansi Flick, it was announced that he will see out the rest of the season for Bayern, although will that change with Pochettino now being available? There are rumors that Bayern would like to speak with Mr. Pochettino, so stay tuned there. Robert Lewandowski and his scoring is insane right now. 23 goals in 18 matches in all competitions for Bayern Munich so far in the 2019-2020 season. Just unbelievable for Lewandowski. So injuries at the back for David Wagner, Schalke could will likely see Weston McKinney, U.S. national team midfielder, play at center back again. It's been a real challenge for Wagner and Schalke, and McKinney and his versatility has been a, a great asset, but it's also not helping McKinney's long-term development. We'll see how he does at center back again this weekend. Leipzig are hosting Köln. Leipzig is still missing Tyler Adams, but Timo Werner has been hot as of late. Five goals in his last two games as we look at the the Bundesliga and so many American players playing in Germany now. I've always expected that Bayern Munich is going to win your title, but they're four points back. They've changed the manager this season. We'll see if Hansi Flick sees it out, but Borussia Mönchengladbach, is not really showing any signs of slipping. And they've been the surprise really on the continent in Europe so far this season. Doing that traditional Scottish favorite, Haggis. Hey guys, look, I highly doubt that Jason put in the Rowdy Roddy Piper music like he should have. <laughs> You know, it's right in front of us, would you? Look at the expressions on their faces. But 
Let's talk about a little bit of Scottish soccer. We'll crack open an arm brew. Quick hit of Scotland to see what's been going on. And uh, yeah, you should absolutely be playing that. Um, should absolutely be playing that Rowdy Roddick Piper music after what happened last week for Scotland. Uh, for the first time in a long time, the country is in good shape in terms of the international game. Celtic goes and pulls off the first win in club history on Italian soil. Meanwhile, Rangers takes down Porto in a very impressive performance in which they pulled the draw, then they pulled the victory. Celtic pulls two victories in the last few minutes of both games. And now Scotland's coefficient is in really good shape, and the clubs are in really good shape right now. Now, whether you know you still want to make a big deal out of the financial issues that may or may not be existing at Rangers, the club's still playing well. They're just going to have questions coming up in January about do you sell Morelos? Do you make any other moves? Are you signed to Jack Kent? How, how much... You know how much of the field does he see as he continues to get uh, get integrated with the club? You know, is, is Steven Gerrard a guy who down the road is going to leave to go down south to take a bigger job? As far as the domestic side of it goes, you know, the the, the cool news that drops in in the middle of the week, closer to the end of the week, is the Partick Thistle move, news. So what you end up with is you have a guy who's living everyone's dream. Dude wins the lottery, the Euro lottery, and wins like 170 million euro or 170 million pounds. I forget the exact amount. But the guy ends up winning a ton of money and starts investing it into Partick Thistle, which is a club up in Scotland. Now, Partick Thistle has kind of played jump rope at times with the championship and SPFL. But this guy invested millions, um, invested a couple million dollars into academy side of things, uh, did some training ground work, I believe, as well. Well, now the big news for him is he buying him buying up 55% or 55% of the shares and then giving it to one of the supporters groups debt free and letting the fans own the club free and clear with no debt associated with it. It's a really cool move. Um, you know, you always get nervous when it comes down to like what lottery winners spending a lot of money. I believe somebody in England did that years ago and and just burned through all their money because you know, sports is an expensive business, but it's a really cool move on the surface, especially. And we'll see how it pans out for him. But, you know, if you're a fan of Parts of Thistle, I think it's a really cool thing to look at. You hope it works out in the long run. It's going to take some time for everything to get ironed out, I'm sure, legally. But no matter what, it's it's a really good look and a really cool look. Hopefully it is not something necessarily that you want to see everyone do because I think it takes a certain circumstance. It takes a certain size of club, a certain financial situation you can't just ask everyone to do the whole fan-owned thing. It's it's not that simple, in my opinion. But as far as the rest of the leagues go right now, I mean, it's look, it's still Celtic on top, Rangers right on their heels. Um, Celtic's looking for nine in a row, and now you have uh, a, a cup competition coming up. It's going to be an old firm cup competition, and uh, Rangers with a with a with a really good shot, I think, to kind of knock Celtic off their perch and take a trophy off of. Uh, off of the, the, the Green and White Club in Glasgow and see if they can be the first team in a long time really to take a trophy away from the hoops. Um, as far as the rest of the league goes, I mean, it's it's just kind of, you're still mucking around trying to figure out who's going to do what. Aberdeen's still kind of disappointing at times. Uh, uh, fans there are still, I think you're, I think you're always going to be having this conversation of do they, do they, do they want a new manager? Is the grass greener on the other side? Do you replace what you have, or do you keep what you have and keep going? Because, well, let's face it, Celtics outspending everybody. It's always going to be Celtics League, especially as Rangers gets their feet back under them. Then it becomes Celtic and Rangers leagues again. Right now, there's just there, there's there's times where, where, where Rangers does hit that that punch and it's impressive, like last year at the end of the regular season. And then you get games like this year's matchup already, where Celtic just looked like far and away the better and more composed team on the field. That's going to be the trend for a while until Rangers really gets their feet back under them and gets their financial situation right again. I think that's going to begin with them getting back to developing young talent and then making sales down the road and continuing the development because right now you're bringing in guys, but you're going to have to start seeing guys go out as well for financial reasons because as it stands right now, you only have one team with a shot at Champions League, and that's going to be your league champion. And as of right now, I mean, you're starting in the second playoff round. And you're not even you're not even getting in, or the second round of qualifying, you're not even getting in the playoff right away. You're having to go through two rounds just to get to the playoff to get into Champions League. That's why that coefficient is so important with Scotland and with Celtic and Rangers. They're going to have to continue 
uh, to keep performing as it stands right now. Both of them look like they're in good shape to make it into the round of 32 for Europa League. It's even more points to the coefficient, a better chance to get multiple teams in the Champions League and multiple teams in the Europa League. And it stood this year, you had two teams in Europa League. You could have had a team in Champions League and two in Europa League, but the cards did not fall in your way in that sense. So we'll keep up with what's going on. We'll check back after another round of Europa League. Uh, thank God the international window is over because if there's a country that gets more just deflated about international, the international game, the United States right now, it's probably Scotland because, my God, it can be an absolute mess of, of, of a national team and just the vibe you get from fans of just, oh, God, just get this over with and get back to league play, please. No, no one wants to be a part of this. You still have your bright moments like Lee Griffiths a couple years ago scoring those two late free kicks against England and earning a draw, but they're just trying to scrap their way into Euro, uh, into, uh, Euro right now. So uh, League competition gets back underway. Europa League get, competition gets back underway pretty soon. Jason, send it back to you. More crumpets and, um, yeah, whatever else we're doing. I don't know. Nick's in Italy right now. He's probably got something else lined up. Uh, so let's take it back to that. Jason, Nick, all y'all. Jessica, y'all have fun. All right, let's take it to the big match of the weekend, the Copa Libertadores final in South America. If you have never watched the Copa Libertadores, it is the equivalent of the Champions League in South America. And in my opinion, it has maybe more drama and more craziness. And this year feels like the biggest final that the competition has seen in quite a while. It's the first time it's gone to a single leg final to neutral site. This year it will be in Lima, Peru. It was originally scheduled to be in Santiago, Chile, which due to the unrest in Chile, it has been moved. It is the defending champions river plate from Argentina against Flamengo of Brazil. If you didn't check out soccer over there from Monday night, second hour of the show, a long preview of the match with our friend Howard Hamilton from Soccer Metrics. Please go back and check that one out to get a good sense of all the deep dive in this one. The match is 3.30 on BN Sports here in the United States. You can watch on Fanatis. You can watch on Fubo TV. If you have BN on your cable provider, you can watch there too. Flamingo comes in as the favorite but they are not the defending champions. And defender Felipe Luis, he says he's a little worried about how his team handles the, the pressure of this. He said that, talking about River Plate, they have had many moments of pressure and managed to overcome them with cool, easily. That plays in their favor. They are the best team now. Many of our players arrived this year. We are still getting to know each other. Well, they, they've gotten to know each other pretty well with a lot of wins in a row, a lot of matches without a loss in a row. However, River is trying to do something that nobody has done since the beginning of the century, back-to-back Copa Libertadores titles. This would be title number three in four years for Marcelo Gajardo and for River Plate, and it would easily make them the best team in South America in this decade. Flamingo, they have not won the Copa Libertadores in 38 years. You're going back to the days of Zico, one of Brazil's greats, when they last won it. This is a team in Flamingo that has spent a lot of money. This is a team in Flamingo that has brought in a Portuguese manager and feels like a European club. And you have a lot of players who are known to European clubs. Gabriel Barbosa, who was at Enter is the leader of this team's attack. Flamingo unbeaten in their last 21 matches. They could end up Brazilian champions after this match without even playing this weekend in the league competition. They have been that dominant in the Brazilian Serie A. All they need is for Palmeiras to not get the full three points against Grêmio. That would give Flamingo their first Brazilian title in 10 years with four matches in hand. Last time in the Libertadores, though, it was 1981. Jorge Jesus has never won an international title. He lost two Europa League finals with Benfica 
2013-2014. Gajardo has had a lot of success in games with trophies on the line, and we know all the rumors about Marcelo Gajardo. Barcelona could be looking at Gajardo. He's been mentioned about Bayern Munich. He appears to be a manager who would fit the profile of Inter Miami as they get launched in MLS. And Miami has said they have their manager in place. They're just waiting to make the announcement. The way that whole deal has gone, you would expect that it's a manager who's currently working. Well, we know that there has been a conversation with Marcelo Gajardo and Miami. So is that where he ends up? It does feel like a bit of the the closing of a chapter for River Plate, and they want to do it in style. They want to do it with the trophy, going back home to Buenos Aires at the end of it. Uh, Rafael Borre, the striker for River Plate, said, In matches like this, the one who is more focused and makes less mistakes will win. That is the kind of match that we players like. It's the kind of match that River Plate has done really well in as well. They're just a team that is a that doesn't make massive mistakes. They're a team that knows how to handle these situations. Now, there have been some questions. Gajardo typically goes with a 4-4-2, but this week in training, there's been a lot of conversation about him trying out three in the back and, and what that could look like in a 3-5-2 type of shake, shape. Uh, Jorge Jesus will play the 4-1-3-2. It's a variation of the 4-4-2 that Flamengo has done very, very well with. River got past Boca in the semifinals. It was uh, not completely easy in the second leg, but River did enough to take care of business. Flamingo just demolished Gremio uh, 5-0 at the Maracanã to get to this point. Security, 10,000 police. You have helicopters. You have drones. This is a massive, massive match, and it is all set to be a great match. We'll be watching it with our friends over at the Brew House Cafe and Little Five Points, the home of soccer over there. If you're listening to this and, and saying, you know what, I need to go check out what the Libertadores is all about, come join us at the Brew House. We'll be in the, the little room, most likely, on the left side when you come into the main bar area. Really looking forward to the Libertadores final. Looking forward to all the action around the world this weekend as the club play returns after the international break. Soccer over there will not be live during Thanksgiving week. Nick is in Italy. There are many things going on. We will have a recorded update for you at the beginning of the week with all of the action that we've talked about today and anything else that might pop up during the weekend. And we'll be back on a normal schedule for soccer over there the following week on December 2nd, if I can uh, read a calendar correctly. So we'll be back at the brew house on December 2nd. We will have a, I don't know what the, the equivalent of Crumpets and Espresso's show title will be for a weekend recap, I guess whatever late night foods we're talking about. And then we'll uh, have another Crumpets and Espresso next weekend as we get ready for, in the United States anyway, the weekend following Thanksgiving and around the world, more action in league play. Lots of things going on this weekend. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back. Until then, mucha plata, y'all. Crumpet Espresso. Brötchen. Café con leche. Do you know what Iron Brew is?